monthly installation of Golf Chats. Uh, my name is Stuart Hood. Uh, I'm the senior preparator of Golf Quest Maritime Museum. So uh, I handle aspects of the museum, uh, exhibit repair, upkeep, and the installation of traveling and new exhibits. Uh, I'm basically the Golf Quest roadie, y'all, so y'all got me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but seriously, um, that was my terrible joke, I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, if you have not done so yet, I would recommend please seeing our Spirits of the Passage exhibit. Uh, it is the story of the transatlantic slave trade that we have on display here from the Mel Fisher Museum through until the middle of June 2023. Uh, in addition, we are in the process of establishing a new exhibit uh, dedicated to the work of Dr. E.O. Wilson in the near future. So these are some new events that we do have coming along here. Uh, tonight we are pleased to host uh, author Ben Rains. Uh, ben Rains is an environmental journalist and filmmaker who is known for his coverage of environmental issues in both Alabama and the Gulf Coast. His work has appeared on PBS and he has authored books such as Saving America's Amazon, The Threat to Our Nation's Most Bi uh, Biodiverse River System, and The Last Slave Ship, The True Story of How Clotilda Was Found, Her Descendants, and Extraordinary Reckoning, uh, both of which are available here at Gulf West if y'all are interested. Uh, uh, ben is dedicated to the protection and sustaining uh, um, Alabama and the Gulf of Mexico's important natural resources. And without further delay, I'm going to turn the mic over to him. Thank you, Stuart. Um, well, it's good to be here again. Uh, I'm the guest today of the Alabama Coastal Foundation, and um, you know they're they're not here to. Well, some of them are, but they're, um, Mark isn't, isn't here. He usually likes to get up and say something, so we're going to do without that, so I'm going to do it on his behalf. Um, the Coastal Foundation has been a good friend to me and helped me get uh, the bulk of the funding for the Underwater Forest, um, the documentary we did about the ancient Cypress Forest we found out in the Gulf. Um, they also contributed funding to um, the Carnivorous Kingdom, which was my most recent documentary, which is about some of the stuff we're going to see in here. Um, it's, a, it's about our pitcher plants and the bogs. Um, it's been on public TV a couple times. It came out last October. You can watch it on YouTube, uh, but don't watch the one on the Alabama Public TV website because it's 1080 and it looks terrible. If you search a little harder with my name in YouTube, you'll find the 4K version and it looks really good because it's all macro videography and, and stuff like that. Uh, so today we're here to talk about um, the Delta and Alabama and what we are doing and aren't doing to take care of it and why it's special. Um, the actual talk, the title I use for this talk is um, Learning to Love Ourselves, How to Escape the Habit of Landscape Pornography. And uh, that's a phrase my uh, old editor, Bill Finch, used to use. Um, he was always frustrated. You know, he had, had this garden column and people would call him all the time with questions usually about their grass, and he, his instant answer was, you're cutting it too short. That was the first thing he'd say to them as soon as they said anything about their lawn. <laughs> um, but he'd get people calling trying to raise plants that should be in the Rocky Mountains or, you know, the Midwest here in Mobile. And um, he called it landscape pornography, saying they'd seen a picture of the Tetons and wanted to bring that here. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we don't really appreciate what's around us. Uh, and I'm going to, is that me? I think that's you. I'll try not to move. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so we're going to start here with this picture I took in Fairhope. This is one of our cloudless sulfur butterflies, native species, and it is nectaring on a Chinese um, plum tree, a cherry tree, rather. Uh, and then here, this is one of our native bumblebees, and it is going into a Chinese princess flower tree. So these trees are about eight feet tall. There's a huge one in Daphne, covered in these giant white blossoms. They're quite pretty. They've actually kind of gotten away from people all over Alabama. You're starting to see them in our, our natural settings. Um, and then there's this. Anybody know what this is? That's right. It's kudzu. Uh, it has a beautiful flower, if you didn't know. It was brought here as an ornamental vine. Um, and kudzu, of course, is native to Japan. And then here is uh, wisteria. You remember a month ago, it was so pretty all over town, blooming everywhere? Well, um, this is the Asian variety of wisteria. That's what's all over town. We actually have our own native wisteria, and this is it. This is a picture I took in the Delta. Most of you have probably never seen the native American wisteria, uh, because the only places you can find it anymore are in swamps. The Asian variety outcompetes it everywhere, but this smells wonderful. It's actually blooming right now. It blooms a month later. 
So next year, when you see the wisteria blooming, I want you to do a little experiment. The American wisteria, the leaves come out and then the flowers. The Asian wisteria, the flowers come out and then the leaves. And I bet you if you look, you will not see this one unless you're on a boat with me early in April next year. Um, and then, of course, this is our state flower. This is the camellia, uh, which is native to Korea, Japan, and China. So you may notice a theme here with our state flower even being from another country. Uh, when Alabama is actually home to more species of flowering plants than any other state, believe it or not. I kind of honed in on the problem when I was working at the Weeks Bay Foundation. The, the foundation won this award from the Alabama Wildlife Federation. And this is the Governor's Conservation Achievement Award given to an environmental group in the state every year. What's interesting about this statue is there's a mountain goat on it. Now, I don't know how many mountain goats you see in your neighborhood, but this is where they live. So it seems to me if we're going to celebrate Alabama, you know, if you want a scary animal, we have bobcats. Uh, this one I saw in the Delta, actually. We have alligators. Um, we have really big rabbits in the Delta. This is a, a, a cane cutter rabbit. Um, we have beautiful bugs. This is the uh, handsome blue-eyed meadow katydid. But instead, we have a mountain goat on this award given for conservation. And I think the reason that is is because of how we and the public in the nation think of Alabama. We think of cotton fields, we think of steel mills, we think of civil rights protests, and now a lot of people think of football. But these are all things we've done to Alabama or in Alabama. They are not what Alabama is, this landscape here beneath our feet. Um, this is a picture of our delta. It's an infrared picture. So this is the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Obviously, that's Mobile down there in the red. What I like about this picture is People and businesses, industry show up as red. Nature shows up as blue, green, and purple. Look how much nature we have right here. And the wonderful thing about the Delta is it's too wet and muddy for them to screw it up. They can't build a bunch of stuff out there. Uh, there is one thing I'm going to point at on this map because I know you all have heard a lot about it. And it is another big orange thing. See that blob? No, I'm going to get that up here. Right there. That's the Barry steam plant. That's, that's where our electricity comes from. And that big orange blob is actually the coal ash pond that you've heard so much about. Um, it's 21 million tons of coal ash. Uh, you remember the big disaster in Kingston, Tennessee um, about 10 years ago where the coal ash pond broke. That was 3 million tons of coal ash. This is 21 million tons. Alabama Power's own predictions, if the dam were to fail, and it has nearly failed several times and has to be repaired constantly. If it were to fail, Alabama Power's own engineers say that 21 million pounds would cover the entire delta all the way across. A killing blow for the whole delta and Mobile Bay. So next time you hear about that issue, just think of that. Because now we're going to talk about what's so special in this place. So this is um, going on right now. Our iris are blooming in the delta, the blue flag iris. Uh, I actually run nature char charters, um, and I'm booked right now every day until May 31st. Um, I'd be booked more than that, but I, I'm cutting off because I don't want to do more trips. Uh, so that's every weekday. Um, but we go see this stuff on our trips. You can actually, in the Delta, you can go out in the lower Delta. This is what, probably a mile north of Bluegill along the causeway, and you can see acres and acres and acres of these iris blooms. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's unlike, it's hard to see something like this in the natural world, just these huge meadows. Now, incidentally, um, here's another uh, picture. This is a little hummingbird nectaring at one. Incidentally, you know New Orleans and Louisiana, they make this big thing with the fleur de lis, and that's their state symbol? They stole that from us. Mobile was the capital of French Louisiana. When the French got here, they saw the irises. Well, irises are a big deal in France, because they have them there, too. Joan of Arc carried an iris battle flag into war. You know, Monet uh, painted French iris. Van Gogh painted French iris. So they get here and they see the iris and they make it their symbol. Because, hey, it's from home. And then they abandon Mobile and they're over there in New Orleans with our iris. So not only did they steal old Mardi Gras, but they took this. Uh, you may recognize this picture from the cover of my book. This is, a, a, an egret. this is the great egret and he's in front of a bunch of our lotus. 
um, the lotus flowers, when the lotus blooms in the delta, there will be, you'll run along a bank for a mile and see these flowers. Now this flower is this big around. It would make a heck of a state flower actually, wouldn't it? Um, you know, really. <laughs> so these bloom in July and August. Really spectacular show. Um, this is the biggest cypress left in the delta. This tree is 32 feet around. That's a normal sized man. He's not a, a stunt midget or anything. Um, this tree is 32 feet around. It's about 700 years old. This is what the delta used to look like before we started logging it. The whole delta has been logged. Some parts of it twice. Um, the, the lower area was logged in the 80s using helicopters. Some of you may remember that. Um, so we used to have forests of redwood-sized trees. When we went to the underwater forest, that's how big those trees were. The trunks had a 10-foot diameter. So it's kind of, you know, we, we don't really know what our state looked like before we got here and started messing it up. <laughs> and that goes back a long way. Um, the delta is also the heart of the Dauphin Island transmigration throughway. This is one of the biggest bird corridors in the country. So here you're looking at a little ruby-throated hummingbird. These birds fly across the gulf, hit Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan, and then they work their way up the sides of the bay and then into the delta. And they can use that as a highway to get all the way up through the entire state of Alabama. And then they spread all over the East Coast. It's, it's a beautiful and fascinating thing. The migration is going on right now. Um, we can actually call birds up to the boat on the trail for voluntary warblers. Um, this is an indigo bunting. Uh, you can go to the, um, in October and April, they do bandings down on Fort Morgan and Dauphin Island. If you go there, sometimes they'll let you turn the birds loose. So you get to hold these little things in your hand. But it's remarkable to think of a bird this big flying across the entire Gulf of Mexico. I just can't get over it. And the thing that we've learned from the bird banding at Fort Morgan, the guy who started it was a guy named Bob Sargent. And he was an electrician in Birmingham. And he started seeing, he was feeding hummingbirds in his yard. This was 30 some years ago. Uh, and he was seeing different hummingbirds. But all the Ottoman people and all the bird people at the university said Alabama only had one species. So Bob went out and got some mist nets that they catch birds in. In his yard in Birmingham, he caught nine species of hummingbirds. This stunned the bird world. Uh, especially because it was an electrician doing it. <laughs> then the other thing Bob did, and he's the one who started the banding on Fort Morgan and Dauphin Island. The other thing Bob did was he started banding these little birds in his yard. And he proved that these hummingbirds would come through and then go back all the way across the Gulf of Mexico and come back to his yard within one to three days of the time he banded them the year before. And so these hummingbirds are able to navigate from Mexico, Central America, across the Gulf, back to his backyard every year. It's a stunning scientific thing, really a big deal. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of the citizen scientist model. So much of American science, science used to be done by students and, and people and just regular, you know, people like us. Um, so, you know, when I, like, looking for the Clotilda, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, if you're interested in something, you can accomplish a lot sometimes just by trying. Uh, these are, these are, um, more uh, blue grosbeaks and indigo buntings down on Dauphin Island. Uh, I love this picture. This is of the causeway. Now you always hear about the West as big sky country, particularly Montana calls it big sky country. But this is big sky country. We don't have any of those mountains in the way. We actually have a bigger sky. But you know, we watch these thunderstorms roll through here. And that's part of the magic of Mobile, of course, and, and Alabama is this is the rainiest part of the nation, the rainiest metro area, the whole state gets an incredible amount of rain. You know, Alabama's actually on the same latitude as Cairo. And think about that. Cairo, the Sahara Desert. If you trace the latitude of Mobile all the way around the globe, up to Birmingham, you'll find all the world's great deserts in our hemisphere are in that same band. We should be a desert. All the American deserts, they're in the same latitude as us. Uh, but we're not because of all the rain. And the rain comes because of the Gulf of Mexico. So we're kind of like a greenhouse. You know, our humid air. We have massive amounts of sun, the same sun that's baking down on the pyramids right now. And then all this rain. It makes a perfect environment for plants and, you know, nature to bloom. So this is one of our uh, fishing guides on the bay. This is Richard Rowland. He's throwing a cast net. Um, the, what you can do in Mobile Bay with a cast net is pretty extraordinary, the amount of fish you can catch because there's so many fish in the bay. Um, now, this is actually a Dauphin Island. 
Um, you may not believe this because we see that brown water, but this is what's underwater around the brown water. Look at all the beautiful seaweeds growing on the rocks. These are the fish called tidewater silversides. Um, you know, when we go to the beach, we see the kind of sand and the water, and we don't really see many fish or anything. But anywhere you get some rocks or some structure out in the Gulf, it's covered in corals and algae. It's, it becomes spectacular. I have to say, um, you know, all the, the gas rigs out there, they're actually beautiful places to scuba dive uh, because there's so much beautiful stuff. Uh, so these are some shrimp. These are larval shrimp. These washed in in January. That's a regular sized pencil. So these are brown shrimp. Um, in June, they're going to be this big and big enough to eat. They grow so explosively. Now, you've always, you may hear that um, our marshes and things are the nurseries for creatures like this, and they are. A shrimp needs 10 parts per thousand um, to, to grow. Otherwise, it can't be in the full Gulf of Mexico, which is 32 parts per thousand. So it has to come to an estuary like ours to hatch. Um, so Mobile Bay is becoming probably the most important estuary in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, it is the fourth biggest river system in the country after the Mississippi, the Columbia, and the Yukon. It, not in the country, in North America. So this is a huge system. Uh, fun fact, 48 billion gallons of water a day come through the delta into Mobile Bay. It's enough water to empty and fill Mobile Bay every two days. We get a lot of water. Um, so the, the, I bring up this um, salinity thing because we used to have two uh, commercial crops of shrimp in Alabama. We had brown shrimp in the spring, we would get in June, and in the fall we had white shrimp. But we don't have a white shrimp harvest anymore. Mobile Bay used to actually be really famous for the white shrimp harvest. The reason we don't have it anymore is because of all the dams on the rivers. We're holding back all that rainwater to use it in the summer. Alabama Power uses it to make electricity, they say, to meet the demand for air conditioning. Well, that is in reality, we make 5% of our electricity um, with hydropower. So we have destroyed uh, an entire shrimp harvest with these dams, not to mention the dozens upon dozens of extinctions they've caused, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this is more about the bounty of Mobile, Mobile Bay. These are baby speckled trout. These are about two, three weeks old. They're about this long. They're perfect replicas of their parents. Um, these are anchovies. Fishermen call them glass minnows or rain minnows. The sound they make when a school moves across the water, uh, it's, it sounds like a tinkling rain hitting the water. Um, but you can eat these anchovies. They're actually delicious. Nobody here harvests them. Uh, and this is a dwarf seahorse. This is a full-grown seahorse caught uh, over in Fort Morgan in the grass beds back on the back side of the peninsula. Um, they mate for life, uh, if you can believe that. That's, that's as big as they ever get. When I caught this one, it actually had its tail wrapped around its mate, and I caught the pair of them together. I just think that's extraordinary. If you can imagine two little guys like this in a grass bed finding each other, and then managing to stay together with storms and all that stuff. Now, incidentally, this is a pregnant man. Um, this is, you know, we've got this whole transgender thing going on. This is different. Uh, seahorses and pipefish, the males carry the babies and give birth. Um, so some of you ladies out there may want to talk to your husbands. Um, this is a little shrimp from uh, Weeks Bay. It's pregnant. It's, it's a very small shrimp, a little grass shrimp, but it's, you can see it carrying its eggs. Um, these are uh, a couple of mangrove snappers. The baby, the little one, is about two weeks old. The big one's about three months old, both in the grass beds, both young of the year. The little one's in danger of being eaten by the big one, actually. But this is a, a, an interesting signal, this fish. When I was a kid, and I'm 53, we didn't have mangrove snapper in Alabama. Um, they didn't really start showing up here until first in the late 80s and the 90s, and there may have been a few stragglers around. Now they're a totally resident fish. Um, it's part of a process called the tropicalization of Mobile Bay. We actually are now catching snook, a fish from South Florida, in uh, Weeks Bay. We're catching bonefish on the beaches in Gulf Shores. This is a fish you would never see north of Miami. And so what's happening is we're having the oceans warming up and we're getting new fish in our, um, in our waters. And it's gonna change the composition of what we catch and stuff as these, because you know, snook is a major predator. Um, it, but it's one of those climate change signals and we're kind of, you can see it in the fish. Um, there was a big, big moment where this became apparent at the Dauphin Island Deep Sea Rodeo. 
Several fishermen came in with huge pompano. If you know what a pompano looks like, it looks just like a permit. But permit don't live up here. They don't come set north of really, you know, certainly St. Pete, but typically they're down in the Keys. But these fishermen were all catching permit here. Um, so, you know, our waters are changing. This is a little tessellated blenny. Uh, it's a fish about this long. It lives inside big barnacles on the rigs in the Gulf and the mouth of the bay. Super fun. Now we're going to talk a little about the land. This is one of our pitcher plant logs. Um, the red things you see are flowers. The white things that light up are the pitchers themselves. Here you can see the pitchers. Alabama is home to 11 species of pitcher plants. Oh no, 10 species of pitcher plants. There are 11 in the country. There's only one species in the country that doesn't live in Alabama. There are only two species, uh, well, there are three species that only live in Alabama. So we are a global, we are the global hotspot for these new world pitcher plants. Think about that, 10 of the 11 species live here. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, here's a little praying mantis on one. Here's one I cut open, and you can see all the love bugs it's eaten. And so the, the way these things evolved in the bogs, the bogs are very nutrient poor environments. It's pine trees and sandy soils, and so much water courses through them that all the nutrients get washed away. So for plants to survive there, they had to figure out another way to get nitrogen. You know, nitrogen is what we spray on our plants. That's what's in miracle Grow. That's the fertilizer. So these plants evolved to get bugs and eat them to get the nitrogen. Pitcher plants actually have a bunch of strange tricks. Um, the lip of the plant uh, exudes this, this sweet nectar that attracts butterflies and flies and things. And so then the little bugs come and land on it. But the, the whole lip of the plant is a slippery wax, and they slip inside the plant. And then when they get down in the plant, they fall into the water, and they try and climb out, but there are these downward pointing hairs that they can't get over. And then the liquid in the plant has two uh, devious things in it. One, digestive juices, similar to what's in our mouths. And two, a narcotic that knocks the bugs into kind of a woozy state where they kind of quit trying. So imagine, we have plants that um, drug people animals, rather, as they digest it. Not people, but uh, this is another one of our carnivorous plants. This is a sundew. Um, those little globs are nectar the plant puts out to attract things. It looks like water. Bugs will come down because it smells good. And then they get caught, and they can't get away. And the thing the sundew does that's really fascinating, when it gets hold of a bug, all those little tentacles, you can watch this happen. It's in my documentary. You can watch it. They close up around the bug. The plant is able to move those things like arms or fingers and hold a bug. So the fly that's stuck on there will then find itself totally enveloped with these little arms which secrete digestive juices and digest the bug. Here's a dragonfly. They can actually catch birds and frogs and things too. Um, really neat. This is uh, a green link spider. Now, you know, banana spiders we see all the time. Well, this is that size. It's a green spider this big. It's all over in the bogs. It hunts bees, hornets, and wasps. And it does this by clinging to plants. And when one comes, it pounces on it and injects this venom. And it will kill the bug or paralyze the bug within seconds. You can actually see that in the carnivorous kingdom, too. Um, they also, if you approach a mother green link spider while she's guarding her egg ball, you know, once they lay their eggs, they quit eating and just guard it, she will spit at you. And the stuff she spits at you can temporarily blind you. So imagine that spider. The way we learned this was actually servicemen training at Eglin Air Force Base over in uh, near Panama City. They were this was happening to them as they were training, and they had to figure out what was going on. This is a hummingbird hawk moth nectaring on a liatris. This is a moth we have that flies like a hummingbird. Its wings beat something like 70 times a second. It can fly 15 miles an hour, but it's actually a moth. Uh, really incredibly cool. Uh, this is Gandalf. <laughs> uh, this is actually a, an old marine biologist named Steve Heath. He was the chief marine biologist for the state of Alabama until he retired. When he retired, um, two things happened. Uh, he grew a really long beard and a ponytail, and he started playing bongos on the streets in Fairhope as part of the drum circle. This was for someone who knew Steve only in a blue blazer at official meetings where I was a reporter. This was quite a transformation. Um, he also became one of the bog men. And these are people who go around and try and protect some of these pitcher plant bogs. Um, and Steve protected the one he's standing in, which is over along Fish River. 
Now, it's not the one that you can go to publicly. This is a private little blog. Um, but it is the only place, uh, or was at one time, the only place left where you could find these white fringe orchids. We've, we've found it in a couple other places now. But that is an orchid that you're looking at right there. We have 54 species of orchids in Alabama, which is a lot of species of orchids. Um, this one is blooming right now. If you want to go up to Splinter Hill, um, go up to the Nature Conservancy side in Splinter Hill. It's, it's uh, the Raven Perdido exit up 65. As soon as you get out of your car, you will see acres of pitcher plants. It's beautiful. It's the vistas you see in, in the carnivorous kingdom. This orchid is this big. It looks like something you'd see for sale at Winn-Dixie or Lowe's, you know, the orchids they always have for sale. Um, this is a, a tiny frog, and that's another orchid up there. That's the snake mouth orchid. This is what it looks like. Um, this is the green fly orchid. This lives up in the trees. If you go to Blakely uh, after a storm and you find some live oak limbs on the ground, chances are very good you'll find some of this orchid growing on. Uh, it's all over in the Delta. I used to think it was rare. Now I find it everywhere I look. The flowers are about that big, but don't they look like little green flies with their wings and everything? This is another one of our orchids. This is another one of our orchids. I call this one the Cheeto orchid. Um, it's the orange fringed orchid. And then we go up to the Red Hills. So the area up around Monroeville. Um, it's a really unique area with a lot of um, unusual things about it in the terms of the natural world. For a long time, um, botanists would tell you that the Great Smoky National Park was the center of oak tree diversity on Earth because they had counted 15 species of oaks in the boundaries of the park, so like 100,000 acres. Five years ago, a group of scientists working up around the Roble in the Red Hills found 20 species of oak on a single hillside. That is now the global epicenter of oak tree diversity, and it's right here in Alabama. There is nowhere on Earth you can find more species of oak trees, and even on one hill. I mean, it's just a stunning thing. Um, and then this is the Red Hills azalea. This is an azalea native to the Red Hills. It lives nowhere else on Earth. I think it would make a great state wildflower. Um, or this one, this is an, our other native azalea, just beautiful flowers, or the Tasca lily, or the big leaf magnolia. The flowers are this big across. I'd rather see it than the chameleon, personally, but we have mountain laurel. This is, um, and this is J.J. Apodaca, and he is holding a red hill salamander. Uh, this is what they look like. They live in holes in the ground up in the red hills. The red hills, the reason the hills are there is they're old coral reefs from when Alabama was entirely underwater 100 million years ago. And so as the seeds are treated, the corals were left high and dry, and dirt collected on them and stuff like that. Um, the valleys are where the dirt washed away, the hills are where, and so these guys live actually in holes in the old coral. Um, it's kind of fascinating. This salamander is about this long. It wasn't discovered until 1976. One of the last salamanders discovered in America and that's the case with a lot of, a lot of things in Alabama. Um, there is one of these salamanders that was caught and given to the Cincinnati Zoo in 1978. And it's still alive at the zoo. Now, I didn't know salamanders lived three years, let alone decades. This, the one up there has been fed six crickets a day for its entire length of captivity, which tells you that things from Alabama are very tough uh, to survive that. Now we talk a little about our fish. Uh, so, I mentioned that we have this giant river system, more miles of rivers and creeks than any other state. It's also by far the most diverse aquatic system in North America and one of the most diverse on Earth. We have, when I started writing the book, Saving America's Amazon, we had uh, 350 species of fish. By the time the book was published, we had 450. To put that in perspective, California has 110 species of freshwater fish. The Cahaba River, which is about 120 miles long, has 150 species of freshwater fish. We have 450. This is the biggest collection by far in the nation, and they're beautiful. These are little darters. I'm going to show you, we have 70 some darter species. I'm going to show you, these are fast, they live in fast streams, they have big fins to propel themselves along the bottom. Um, this is the red fin darter. They all have these wonderful names like the turquoise darter, the lipstick darter, the harlequin darter, the johnny darter. Um, let's look at the variation. Now, 
This is a different fish. Part of the reason we have so many species is because Alabama never froze. Uh, so the ice ages that happened, they happen kind of cyclically every 100,000 years or so, in, typically in history. And we're coming out of an ice age still now. That last ice age, most of America was under a glacier up to a mile thick. And it came all the way down to about Tennessee. Alabama never froze. Um, now, it did snow here. In fact, one of the things we proved with the underwater forest, when we did sediment cores out there and looked at the pollen and the seedbed we found out there, was the forest out there, which was a cypress forest, wasn't like the delta is today. To find a forest with the same tree composition, which was cypress and alders and oaks and things, to find a forest like what the underwater forest was 70,000 years ago today, you have to go to Virginia. So that tells us that it snowed a lot here, it was much colder, the trees had to be more cold tolerant. So if you extrapolate a little further from that, Sea, sea levels, when the underwater forest was exposed 70,000 years ago, were about 300 feet lower. Uh, so that would make Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan mountains towering over the horizon, and it would have snowed on them. So Alabama would have had snow-capped mountains where we have the beach now. I just think that's funny. Uh, these next six spe species I found in a creek along Highway 225 in Baldwin County. These are just from one little creek. So this guy, um, he's a little shiner. This is a chub. This is a long-eared sunfish. Uh, this is a rainbow shiner. These things are beautiful. They, you know, remember we all raised neon tetras in aquariums? These are so much more psychedelic looking. Uh, it's, these are them in the water. Um, and this is a blue-nosed shiner. Um, we should have been raising these Alabama fish in aquariums all along. Uh, you know, almost all the tropical fish in, in the pet stores are from the Amazon. Um, so I kind of want to change that equation and get some of these fish going. They do great in aquariums. Um, and then there's our, our, um, our crawfish population. Uh, this is the rusty grave digger. We have 97 species of crawfish, by far the most in the nation. Um, you know, people think Louisiana is the crawfish state and all that. They have 32 species. California, three times bigger than Alabama, nine species. The state of Washington, which is home to the Columbia River, the second biggest river system in North America, has one species. All of Europe has four. And one of those is an American species that's invaded over there. So the largest collection of crayfish in the world in an area of the geographic size of Alabama. This is one of the larger ones. Um, we have a species here, the red swamp devil, which is actually the one we grow and eat, that gets up to 13 inches long in the wild. You know, that's a lobster. This is its burrow. These are burrowing species. They dig a hole in the ground and go down in the woods and go down to the water table and make a den in the water table. And they live in there in the daytime. And then at night, they come out and hunt on the forest floor, um, catching roly polies and frogs and stuff like that. But kind of fascinating. Uh, <laughs> incidentally, the, the species in the water have great big tails and tiny claws because they need to be able to escape from fish and things. The species that live on land have tiny tails and huge claws because they need to go to fight. And their running away is on their feet, not, their, not using their tails. Then there's our turtle hey, population. Uh -huh. Can I ask a quick question? Sure, sure. That uh, last picture, I, did, I couldn't see the crawl there. He's not in it. The, oh, okay. I'll just show you how big the hole is. So that, that the hole is as big around as the animal's shell. So that crawfish was about this big around. Wow. That's that. Okay. I should have explained that better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is a stink pot turtle, um, the musk turtle. Um, I caught this in Fish River, very cute. Um, and they're called stink pot turtles because they have uh, glands around their shells that exude this nasty smelling stuff that makes you not want to eat them. Uh, I definitely didn't want to eat him after he musked me. Um, but the Mobile Tensaw Delta, right outside the door here, has 17 species of turtles. That is the most species of turtles in any river delta on Earth. Think about that for a second. That's incredible. More than the Amazon, the Mekong, the Nile, the Ganges, you name all these famous rivers, right here in Alabama. Um, this is a picture of um, an extinction event going on. Uh, these are red bay trees. This was used to be one of the top five trees in our coastal environments and in the delta. And about 10 years ago, they all died in one summer. And you could just watch it like this. Um, and it was a beetle 
from Asia that came in packing materials. And it came into Mississippi and it came into Florida. And the beetle would bore into trees in the laurel family, which red bays are. Um, and it had a bacteria inside the beetle. And the bacteria would uh, proliferate in the water transport chambers of the tree and close them off. And so no water can get up to the leaves and the tree dies. So we have lost about one out of every five trees in the delta, along Dog River, Fish River. But it means more than that because the same creature also attacks avocados, uh, so where we get guacamole, and it attacks sassafras, which is also in the laurel family. And that's where we get filet powder for gumbo um, and root beer uh, from the roots. Uh, that's why I call root beer, incidentally. It's made of sassafras root. Um, so this one beetle may rob us of guacamole, good gumbo, um, and root beer. This is a terrible pest. Um, but, you know, seriously, our natural world is under threat all the time. Never mind us polluting it and building houses on top of it and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is the Tumatoma snail. This is actually an amazing <coughs> success story. Uh, so I've talked a lot about Alabama being number one in all these things. And we are the number one state in terms of fish species, mussel species, snail species, turtle species, salamander species. Um, we have more than any other state by quite a lot. Uh, this was actually a stunning discovery to, for the scientific world in 2002. Nobody thought of Alabama as a diverse place in 2002. And then the Nature Conservancy produced a, a, a report. They made an organization called NatureServe. And they pr produced a compendium of all the species in the nation, divided by state. Everyone was stunned when Alabama was number one in aquatic diversity. Nobody imagined that would be the case. Um, Alabama was number five in overall diversity, after California, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, but by square miles, Alabama is twice as diverse as any of those states. We have more than twice as many species per square mile as any other state in the country, um, which is stunning. Now, I did say we were number five. We're now number four. We've knocked New Mexico off. We are coming for Arizona. Um, I mentioned we had 100 new species of fish during the time I wrote the book. We had about 15 new species of, of crawfish. We're adding plants all the time. That red hills azalea I showed you. That was only identified about 10 years ago. Um, so we're all those things, but we're also the king of something else. We are the leaders in extinction. More than half of all extinctions in the continental United States happened in Alabama, and they're still happening. Um, you know, you can't go on being the most diverse state and the state with the most extinctions. We have more extinctions than Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Louisiana put together. That's a stunning thing. Uh, and we have a lot more species that are on the brink. One of the main culprits are the dams on our rivers. Um, and, you know, Alabama Power has finally had their permit revoked and is being modified because it was finally proven it was basically illegal and that the, the federal government had not done the proper work giving those permits. So Alabama Power, you remember I said they were holding all that water back? They were holding so much water back that um, the Coosa River, every year they would call it the dead river because there wasn't enough flow through the river to keep the water oxygenated and everything in it would die. The seven dams on the Coosa River are responsible for more extinctions than any other factor in US history. It's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, but back to this snail, I said a success story. This snail was uh, on the endangered species list. It was in the most imperiled category. The state started raising them in a hatchery in Marion. There's something else in Marion besides the military academy, it turns out. There's a state fish hatchery. Uh, and so they started raising the Tulatoma snail, and they raised a whole lot of them, and they released them into the wild, and they have repopulated their home ranges. And Alabama Power now has to push enough water through the Coosa River to keep the water oxygenated at all times. And so the snails are thriving and they've been taken off the endangered species list. They're now on the threatened list, which is a less intense classification. It is the first mollusk in US history to make that move, to get taken off the endangered species list. So that's good. But then a lot of people say to me, well, who cares if a snail goes extinct? Um, look at these snails from Alabama. They're actually quite beautiful and really different looking. 
But I'll use the oil spill as an example. In the marsh, every uh, anybody who's been in the salt marsh, you see these little snails all over on the blades of marsh grass. You see people nodding. That's the marsh periwinkle. Um, when the oil spill happened, marshes that got oiled, the snails died, even after they tried to clean them up because they're very sensitive to hydrocarbons. In those marshes, the marsh grass was doing fine. It survived the oil just fine. But they all died. And it turns out it was because of the missing snail. The marsh periwinkle spends its days going up and down the blades of marsh grass eating algae. When you take the snail away, the algae overwhelms the plant and it can't photosynthesize. So we never know what the keystone species in an ecosystem is. In our marshes, it turns out it's a tiny snail the size of a marble. You take that out, you lose the entire marsh, which means all the birds that depend on it, all the crabs, the fish, the shrimp, us, just because of that snail. So that's what I say to people when they ask, who cares if a snail goes extinct? Um, and this is some of our muscles. Uh, I won't talk too much about them. Um, but this muscle, you see those big buckets down there? This is called a wash tub muscle. They're this big. And they live here in Alabama. Alabama has 145 mussel species left. We've lost quite a few to extinction. Largest collection on the globe by far. Um, Alabama was uh, mussel shoals. Alabama was the button-making capital of the world before the invention of plastic. And it was because of these muscles. The mussel shells are very beautiful inside. And they had these machines, and they would punch them out and little buttons. If you have a vintage dress or shirt, uh, take a look at the buttons. You may realize they're mother of pearl. Chances are, no matter where you lived in America, they were made from mussels from Alabama. Um, it's kind of amazing. But we started altering our rivers as early as 1850, this is, uh, or 1880, this is 1882, and they're actually building a lock to get around Muscle Shoals. And the reason they were doing that was to get coal from North Alabama to the Gulf, to ship it to other places. Um, so we've been messing with the rivers for that long. Um, this is the Lay Dam. This is, um, this actually gave electricity to my grandparents for the first time. Um, <coughs> and it was the first of the 30 major dams in Alabama, which have totally altered our systems. So out west, you know, they make those fish ladders for one species of salmon to get up past the dam. Well, we have 30 dams. We have about 18 species of fish that typically would migrate from the Gulf up into the state to spawn. Sturgeon, uh, moon eyes, there's a whole bunch of them. We don't have a single fish ladder anywhere in the state. If you talk to people who were in um, Birmingham in the 50s before the dams went in, they'll talk about cast netting mullet in the Cahaba River. Now imagine if mullet still ran up the Cahaba River. And what this was, was a massive energy exchange where we were taking energy from the Gulf of Mexico and depositing it in North Alabama, fueling our whole ecosystem. And we have totally shut that down. Uh, and we need to try and fix it. Um, this is uh, Smith Lake. You know Smith Lake? This is a beautiful double 60-foot waterfall that used to be on Clear Creek which was flooded when they made Smith Lake. We, we can't really imagine how beautiful these river valleys were that have been lost, and they've all been lost. Um, before uh, the dams, starting in the 1800s, Alabama was considered one of the most important fossil sites in the world for finding dinosaurs and things like that. And they were all found along the rivers, and now they're all underwater. If you go to the Smithsonian, you will find multiple animals collected from Alabama in the 1800s. The biggest, uh, one of the biggest skeletons in there is a Bacillosaurus, or a Zuglodon, which was this gigantic whale that ate primitive dinosaurs here. And they find them all up around um, St. Stephen's and the Clayton Dam, the Highway 84 corridor. Uh, and there are actually houses up there that where they used the backbones of this whale, which are like this big, you know, fossilized, as the supports for houses. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. <laughs> they just thought they were, you know, big weird rocks. This is a sturgeon. This is um, the Gulf sturgeon. It was the biggest freshwater fish ever caught. It was 345 pounds. Sturgeon no longer migrate up our rivers because of the dams. Um, when the Fish and Wildlife Service listed critical habitat for Gulf sturgeon, they started over in Texas and Louisiana, all critical habitat, all their rivers, Mississippi. They got to the Alabama border, and they stopped. And they went to Florida. 
Alabama is no longer considered habitat for sturgeon because of the dams. We even had our own sturgeon, the Alabama sturgeon. It was about three feet long. The last known one disappeared about 15 years ago, and it's never been seen again. Um, to see, uh, we had a shad, the Alabama shad. If you want to go catch an Alabama shad, you have to go to the Chattahoochee River. Um, because it free flows and our rivers don't. This is a paddlefish. We are at the uh, Miller's Ferry Lock and Dam electroshocking. You see his nose? It's rubbed off because he's rubbing against the dam trying to find a way around it. This one had his whole nose broken off. So this is a picture of a kid from a jubilee. These are flounder. Um, you hear about jubilees all the time. Daphne calls itself the Jubilee City. You know, jubilees are where the animals come up to shore and you can catch them. Well, that's actually a warning sign. Um, what's happened is there's a low oxygen, a dead zone in the bay, just like the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, where water oxygen levels in the water are so low it can't support marine life. And with a certain condition of tides and winds, it gets pushed to shore. And it pushes all the creatures up to the very edge where they're trying to get, you know, it's the most oxygenated water. And so they're trying to survive. And that's when people are digging them and all that. Um, on the eastern shore, it typically sets up when we have an east wind and those high bluffs. And so the wind misses the first part of the bay and there are no waves. But now, the last five years, we've begun having them on the western shore of Mobile Bay. What that means is our dead zones are bigger. Um, there was a, a, an oyster reef in the middle of the bay called the White House Reef. And it had disappeared. And the state thought it was because it had been over-harvested. So they did this bizarre, controversial thing that I had to write about, where there was a huge, thriving oyster reef off Brooklyn. And they spent three weeks letting the oyster men tong up all the oysters and put them on a huge barge. And they took them all to the White House Reef, and they dumped them in. And they came back two weeks later, and every single one of them was dead. The reason the White House Reef disappeared wasn't because it was over-harvested. It was because we started having these dead zones. And the dead zones are related to all the fertilizers coming down uh, from our lawns, from our sewer plants, uh, from our farms, into the water. They, they fuel, oxygen, they fuel uh, algae blooms, and algae dies and falls to the bottom and sucks up all the oxygen. This is exactly what happened to the Chesapeake Bay. I used to live in Maryland, and I fished in the Chesapeake Bay. And um, it was dying, and you could tell. Uh, when I lived there, all the oysters that you would eat in oyster houses weren't from Virginia and Maryland. They were from the Gulf Coast. The blue crabs, Maryland is the crab state. That's like they have this whole thing. You know, Maryland is for crabs, blah, blah, blah. All their crabs that they're serving in their restaurants and stuff were coming from Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi because they killed them. Now, this happened 30 years ago in Chesapeake because there are a lot more people there. But this is what's happening down here now. This was 2009. Um, we suddenly started finding every fish species in Mobile Bay having these lesions all over it. Um, sheephead, sheephead, redfish, mullet, flounder, you name it, they have these lesions. For the first time ever, the state issued a do not consume fish from Mobile Bay warning because they didn't know what happened. When it was all said and done, some Auburn scientists figured out that what happened, we had a very wet spring and it was cold. It flushed so many pesticides into Mobile Bay from the farms that it destroyed the slime coating on the fish and left them vulnerable to infection. That's a really big warning sign. Uh, if you, you know, there are more people moving to Alabama. I always say that our environment has survived because of benign neglect. There weren't that many people here, so there was enough environment. But we keep taking little pieces and destroying little pieces, and that equation isn't working anymore. Uh, this was um, Dog River, and this was about, I don't know, 15 years ago. Every time it rained, I started going there and taking pictures of all the trash floating on Dog River. And it kind of became a viral thing around the country. The trash would gather up in Mobile Bay in such huge mats that fishermen would go target triple tail, which is a fish that likes to be under things. They would go target the floating trash mats in Mobile Bay to catch triple tail. So I'm publishing these stories every time we have a big rainstorm. The mayor of Mobile comes to the newspaper and seeks me out. And he says, you're embarrassing the city of Mobile. And I said, yes, sir, mayor. I'm going to do it every time it rains until we fix this problem. At the time, the Dog River Revival, Clearwater 
Dog, Dog River Clearwater Revival Group had purchased a giant litter trap and they wanted to put it in the river to catch the trash where it was coming off I-10 and the city before it got to the large part of the river. The city wouldn't pick up the garbage from the litter trap. I mean, people raised their own money to buy this thing and the city of Mobile was refusing to pick up the garbage washing into its rivers. They finally did the right thing, um, and so this doesn't happen anymore. But the mayor wasn't mad that all the trash was going in the water. He was mad I was telling people. That's, you know, we can't go on that way. Um, so this is uh, taken from Skylab back in the 70s. And what you're seeing here is a massive plume of mud coming in right over here. Yeah, right there from the construction of the Lake Forest subdivision. Um, it lasted for 10 years. It was the largest subdivision ever built in America at the time. So much mud flowed off of the construction site that Dole Leaf Bay, which used to be 10 feet deep, was left one foot deep at the end of it. Dole Leaf Bay is gone. Um, so much mud came down that it destroyed all the grass beds on the eastern shore by smothering them and making the water so cloudy for 10 years the grass couldn't grow, couldn't photosynthesize. If you talk to people who grew up on the eastern shore up until the early 70s when this started, Mobile Bay, the entire eastern shore was grass beds. They're totally gone. More than 50% of the grass beds in Alabama are now gone. This is our nursery habitat. Remember all the little fish I showed you? They were all in the grass beds. We've already lost half of our grass beds. And we keep losing them. We're not making more. We also lost most of our oyster reefs in Mobile Bay, um, especially our hard old relic ones because the state let uh, a company, um, the Radcliffe Company, mine them to use the oyster crush. These are old relic oyster shells. They would dig down 30 feet deep in the bottom of the bay um, to make roads for concrete is what they were letting them dig it up for. Um, and so now Mobile Bay has a layer of clay free-floating suspended clay on the bottom about this deep. If you put a mask on and go in the bay on a clear day, you'll see what I'm talking about. What it is is the clay particles all have electrical charges and they repel each other, so they'll never settle on the bottom. And there's no grass to grab them, and there are no oyster reefs to hold them. So every time the wind blows, it instantly stirs that up and Mobile Bay turns totally brown. You've seen it with your own eyes. I mean, it happens like that. And it's our fault. Um, we, we've, we've really wrecked Mobile Bay. <laughs> we gathered oysters out of Mobile Bay. Uh, and the state, in the, starting in about 1900, the state was hiring people to gather oysters from the other oyster reefs all around the bay and take them all to Portersville Bay and put them in the water there so they'd be easier to get to the harvest area. They would just go dredge all the other oyster reefs and dump them in Portersville Bay. We used to harvest millions of pounds of oyster meat a year. Meat, I said, not the shells, just the meat. We were harvesting millions of pounds a year for 100 years. 2018, we harvested 13,000 pounds of oysters, counting the shell. We have totally lost our oysters that we used to have. Um, this is uh, the Escatapa River. This was a construction site. In Alabama, you're not allowed under the state construction laws to dig in a stream with heavy equipment. When we walked up to see where the mud was coming from, we found ADEM, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, supervising ALDOT, our transportation builder, while they had about 10 backhoes, not digging in the stream, in the stream, digging in the stream. It was outrageous. This was building um, 98, the new 98, through Mobile, Mississippi. The entire road is finished, by the way. It's a beautiful road. It's been finished for about 20 years. Nobody's ever driven on it because the state Department of Transportation got in so much trouble for filling the wetlands around it with mud that they've walked away. It is the biggest boondoggle you can see. It's just incredible. Uh, this is, uh, remember the 17 acres of Wow, the Toyota, uh, I think it's Palmer Toyota place over in, in uh, Malibus? Um, when they built that 17 acres of pavement for the Toyotas to sit on, um, it's, they, it channeled all the rainwater. Instead of falling in a forest and slowly working its way to a stream, you know, bubbling through the leaves and all, it was all suddenly flushed into the storm drain system. 
and then it all funneled into one pipe, and then it shot into this creek like a fire hose. And so every time it rained, the creek suddenly had a flash flood. The creek used to be up there at the top. Now it's in a canyon 12 feet deep. It's called head cutting, and all that mud has ended up in the bay. So this is the little stretch of stream where I showed you those six species I caught, the, the bright sunfish and all that. That's how an Alabama stream ought to look like. This is Three Mile Creek um, here in Mobile. I know which one I like better. Uh, <laughs> and um, I do have copies of my book here. Here are a few pages out of it. It's a lot of the stuff you've seen. Um, and um, it's, it's a good book. I like it. <laughs> I don't have The Last Slave Ship. I sold out of them the last place I talked. So any questions? Is there any hope? Yes, there's a lot of hope. Um, when I um, moved here, Mobile Baykeeper had one employee. The Alabama Coastal Foundation had one employee. Um, Mobile Baykeeper now has 16, I think, employees and a whole army of interns. Uh, the Coastal Foundation has nine employees and an army of interns. What this tells us is many, many, many more people have joined these environmental groups. Their budgets have exploded. Um, I always say the environmental movement in Alabama is about 20 years behind everywhere else in the country. And it is. Um, and so we're slowly catching up. You know, Mobile still doesn't offer curbside recycling. It's the biggest metro area I can find in the United States that doesn't offer curbside recycling. That's why all that garbage was in the water. You know, in other states, you've got to pay an extra nickel when you buy a can of soda or beer or whatever, and you get it back. Or if you throw it away, somebody comes and collects it for the nickel. But the garbage doesn't end up in the water. And that's why they did it in those places. It was to curb litter. Um, so we're slowly um, catching up. You know, like ecotourism, um, I, I am the only person offering charters in the Delta. If this was California, there'd be 50 guys doing the same thing at the boat ramp every morning. Um, but, like I said, I'm totally booked. I'm turning people away. And the people that are coming now, since this book came out in particular, are from all over the country. Uh, I just had uh, people from Seattle. I, I have people from New York who book me for a week every year. Um, I, I've got people coming from San Francisco in a few weeks. Um, I just had people from Idaho. People all over the country are hearing about Alabama and the birds and the nature and the wildlife and coming here as ecotourists. The people I had yesterday, uh, they came from Atlanta, and they're staying a whole week, and they're going to the places they've seen in the Carnivorous Kingdom and in the book. Um, so, you know, yeah, there's hope, and the, the hope is to make people care about the environment and realize it's the money maker. Alabama's history with the environment has always been extractive, taking, never giving anything back, and we've seen where that's led with all the extinctions. And the worst part of it was the people coming and doing the taking were always from other places. And they were taking all of our resources and money and leaving us with the, the problems and the leftovers. So as we start to understand how valuable this diversity is and stuff, it'll become you know, a reason to protect it. So you know, if you look at ADEM, um, it is the least funded environmental agency in the United States. It has been for decades. And that's by design. Um, you know, they, they brag that they'll give a new industry a permit within 90 days. In California, that would literally take 15 years. Um, and so we have the least restrictive environmental laws in the country. In most states, not most, in every other state, the outfall where you have, the plant has to be, the, the industry has to be at the permitted pollution level is the spot where the drop of water or the gush of water comes out of the plant into a pipe into the river. In Alabama, we give them a one mile long mixing zone. And we say, your industrial pollutants have to be diluted to the permitted level a mile downstream. We are giving our rivers over as sewage treatment plants for industry. Um, you know, it's, it's outrageous. The, the Alabama way has always been dilution is the solution to pollution. And um, we're seeing that's not working anymore because there's more pollution. Um, so, you know, we've got to get the state to tighten up with these things. I always tell people, join your environmental groups. Don't just join Mobile Baykeeper and think that's enough. Join it and join that Coastal Foundation and join the South Alabama Land Trust. It's only like 30 bucks a year to join these groups. But when they go to Montgomery to be the voice for the environment, if all of them have 10,000 members or more instead of 
each one having you know, 2,000. Their voices are much more powerful. Their reach is much more powerful. Um, you know, we've lost our newspapers. The newspapers were the uh, environment's best friend. They all had environment reporters, and we loved our job and were really aggressive and went after problems and pollution and forced Aiden to do the right thing. And you've seen what's happened to AL.com. It's totally gutted. Um, you know, there, there's, well, we had, we had 91 people in the newsroom in 2012. Guess how many they have now? That's right, three. In Mobile, a metro area of three quarters of a million people, we have three reporters at the, what used to be the oldest newspaper in the country, in the state. Um, so uh, we have to become the police, and we do that through our environmental groups. And um, so I encourage you to join them. Yes? Well, since the children are the future, are there any curriculum in the school system, in the public school systems especially, that teach this so the children can be aware and teach mommy and daddy quit throwing everything in the trash and let's recycle it, mommy and daddy? Yes, um, <laughs> and, and I'm proud to say my work is part of that. Um, the, um, the science and math teachers of Alabama made a lesson plan for my documentary, America's Amazon. And we sent it, uh, we sent, this was back in the DVD age, but we sent copies to every school in Alabama with the lesson plan. And so teachers were teaching it all over the state. I hear from teachers all the time who still show it in their classes every year. Um, so, you know, the internet has made all that stuff a lot more available. Um, the state has adopted America's Amazon now and is putting it on posters as a marketing tool for the state. When I, when I first uh, made the film, I got a lot of flack um, for calling it America's Amazon, even from E.O. Wilson, who actually wrote the foreword to this book. <laughs> and he was like, I, we already have an Amazon. And I was like, well, the Delta needs a marketing campaign. You know, it, it's got to have a good, you know, and that's what it is. It's America's Amazon. The next time I saw him, he said, Ben, I was wrong. People are coming up to me, calling it America's Amazon. And he's like, it's, you know, it's, it's brilliant. And so that was a great, because I didn't like him thinking I did something bad. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I think um, as, as the ecotourism grows, you know, the dolphin tours down at the beach are going gangbusters. Um, all that stuff is kind of going to snowball and... Um, you know, the state's actually becoming really famous nationally now for its mountain bike trails in the north part of the state with the Rocky Mountains and all. Um, believe it or not, it's a, and, and for rock climbing. So these things are, are building. Um, it's just going to take time. But if you look at where we were 20 years ago, we're a long way from there, which is good. Uh, yes, ma'am. I believe they're still there. Um, and the good news is they're not in the Delta, uh, but they have proved very hard to eradicate. I haven't actually gone out and looked in a while, and maybe they finally got them under control, but, um, you know, I, I wrote the first stories about them, and, um, gosh, they were still there 10 years later. <laughs> so, um, but they haven't made it to the Delta somehow. Um, so that's good. The apple snail is a snail about the size of an apple. Yeah. Yes, sir. I've got two questions. Um, was there any change to the agricultural runoff when they established the Tennessee Tom Bigby? So the Ten Tom has done a lot of things, and a lot of people think it's brought a lot more um, uh, setup into the system um, than expected, and um, has had other uh, negative effects. I don't know about agricultural runoff but we would be inviting a lot more money in. I just don't know enough about how the connection works to see where the flow would go. Um, it, it didn't do all the good things they promised, and a lot of people think it's done a lot of bad things. Um, it certainly has opened up our systems to uh, exposure to stuff in those other systems. You know, you hear about the silver carp jumping up and hitting people in boats in Missouri and all that, um, and zebra mussels up in um, the Great Lakes. You know, these are things we have to be very worried about down here. Um, so, but I, I don't know the answer to your first question. Second question. Um, I've drawn a point. Um, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> It'll come back to you. <laughs> oh, if there was an accident at a mill, that toxic dump up there, would that in any way affect our watershed? 
No, uh, because it's a dump. You know, you can't. There's not going to be a accident. It's actually a lined dump for hazardous waste. Um, I'm sure the liner has probably degraded since they built it. Um, and you know, typically what happens around dumps is we end up with um, wells where they're sucking the groundwater out to catch the contaminants before they can spread very far. Um, so you know, it wouldn't affect the watershed. If I lived near a mill, I'd be real worried about drinking the tap water. Um, and that's something we've seen in Baldwin County. You all remember the talk of the cancer cluster in mm -hmm. um, Point Clear and Fairhope and everything? Well, I think it was caused by fertilizers from the, between 1920 and 1950. Um, we were using um, phosphate-based fertilizers, and phosphorus has a radioactive signature. And so it takes about 50 or 60 years for those fertilizers to perk through the thing to hit the uh, well layer where our drinking water over there comes from. It's about 150 feet down. And right around that time frame where that stuff would hit it, some of the wells in Fairhope came up uh, with high radionuclides, meaning radioactive elements. And that's when all those people got sick and got all those cancers. It's kind of died down now because Fairhope quit letting any drinking water go that was so high in radionuclides. Now, I would tell you that they quit using those wells, but my understanding is they just started mixing them with other wells to get the lower, you know, dilution is the solution to pollution. Um, yes, ma'am, you were... Um, yes, you talked about the loss of grass beds. Once they're gone, is there anything we can do to encourage them or to get replenish them? Yes, um, we can, and we, we're doing some of that. You hear about these living shorelines where they're um, putting objects in the water, concrete balls, uh, oyster shells in bags, to break the wave energy coming to shore. Um, they're doing that for erosion uh, because the ship wakes from these giant ships we have coming through are tearing up our shorelines faster and faster, causing more erosion all the time. But the living shorelines are working um, in some measure in that uh, grasses have, have recolonized by behind a few of them in small measure. Typically, um, sometimes it's not our native grasses, it's milfoil, which is an invasive, but it does function well in limited numbers in the environment. Um, so, you know, there is some hope of that, but we've got this problem of rising sea levels. And I don't know if you all saw the story in the news last week that they're, they, this is where they're coming up the fastest in America. And um, it's like eight inches in the last hundred years or something. Really dramatic, and people were really surprised. Um, well, so what's going to happen? Mobile Bay is uh, becoming a bathtub. Because of all the erosion, people are getting permits to build seawalls all the time. Well, when you build a seawall, eventually the beach in front of it disappears. And so you don't have an intertidal zone, which is where all the birds eat stuff. It's where the crabs do their thing and all that. You just have deeper and deeper water in front of the seawall. And the tide just goes up and down like a bathtub. Um, so as sea levels rise, we've got people now building right up to the edge of the wetland zone where they're allowed to build. Well, that's going to be underwater soon. And so those people are going to build seawalls. And so we're going to lose more and more of that habitat. My, my new film I'm working on is called The Last Estuary. And it's about Mobile Bay. And it makes the case that Louisiana is washing away. Nothing can be done about it. We're losing the largest marshland in the United States. Mississippi has already destroyed their marsh. That fake beach is the largest fake beach in the world. It's 60 miles long. And um, so they've already lost their marsh. So then Alabama's little 54-mile coastline becomes all the marsh left to power that zone between here and Texas in terms of nursery habitat. So I have been, um, well, since uh, the, the BP oil spill money, trying to encourage the state to use that money to buy all the uplands around the bay that are available so that we have somewhere for the marsh to retreat to. Because if it's all houses, there's nowhere for it to go. And has, when you mentioned the oil spill, has there been any um, studies or anything done of a correlation between like the dispersant used and loss of grass beds or anything? No, we, the dispersants, that they're, they were used so far offshore. Um, I, uh, I don't believe any of the dispersant stuff. Um, I was one of the most aggressive reporters in the country on the oil spill issues. Um, I would have people calling me, telling me they were getting sick from the disper dispersants that were sprayed 100 miles away. It's just not um, how that kind of stuff works. I will say the dispersant use saved Mobile Bay 
and Alabama and Mississippi. Louisiana got oiled. It was much closer to the wellhead. By the time the oil got here, what little bit of oil got in hit our beaches, which is great. It makes a, a tar ball and you pick it up. Um, a very small amount of oil got in Mobile Bay, uh, but none of our marshes got oiled. We didn't lose any of that kind of habitat. Um, so, you know, the dispersion was actually a good thing. I'd rather have that oil 5,000 feet down where it's pretty much segregated from the ecosystem we're a part of than anywhere else. Um, you know, sometimes you have to pick your poison. Yes, ma'am? I have two questions, I'll say. The first one, um, what about lionfish? Are they They're delicious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. I heard, that's what I've heard, but do we have a problem with them here? So they're here in big numbers. Um, they have been for quite a while. Very, very few have ever been found close to shore. Um, I speared one at um, the jetties at Perdido Pass, and that was the shallowest anybody had found one. Uh, the close-in area is, is uh, say, less than 50 feet deep, and, and in, including the underwater forest, which is 58 feet deep. Those areas get so cold in the wintertime, the lionfish can't survive in them. Uh, and those areas are really frequented by scuba divers who shoot them, because, uh, like I said, they're good to eat. Um, but when you go out to the deeper wrecks at 100 feet, there um, they can survive the winter because the water doesn't get as cold at depth out there, and they're not as many divers. And so when I go dive on something at 100 plus feet, it'll be covered in lionfish. Um, like you could you could shoot 30 or 40 on a little wreck, um, and if you shoot them all, you come back two weeks later and they're back. Um, and so they are breeding and living out in that deeper water, um, and they're a threat. Some of the, we, we have documented that some grouper um, in Florida have started eating them, um, which is great, you know, but it takes a big fish or a small lionfish. Um, so, you know, new arrivals in the environment. I mentioned all those new fish species coming, um, but we, we do still have lionfish. Uh, it's just, there's a, there, are, there are a number of people making uh, livings catching to, to sell to restaurants and stuff. And you can go to certain restaurants down at the beach and buy lionfish dinner, you know. Mm. And it's really good. It's a beautiful white meat. It's delicious. I just remember a few years ago they were talking about it on the news and right. that they had invaded. My other question is when I was a little girl we always saw the bot site on the, on the side of the road going over Cochrane Bridge and then, you know, started getting covered with beautiful green and everything. How does that affect? It's a disaster are? waiting to happen. Um, she's talking about the tailings from the old Alcoa aluminum plant. And this stuff is incredibly toxic. If you remember about 15 years ago or so, there was a town in Europe that was flooded with the exact same stuff and destroyed the river there and all that. Um, a deal was made to allow Alcoa to run away from Alabama and leave that mess here. And it never should have happened. Um, the um, selenium levels in those ponds out there around where you're talking about. It's an Alabama birding site that people go to. Fish and Wildlife is worried that the birds stopping there and feeding in those flats over that stuff are picking up a, a, a dose of selenium that will prevent them from breeding successfully every time they visit. Uh, so that's another one of our challenges that needs to be cleaned up for sure. But you never hear anything about it. No, you don't. And, and we don't have a, a forum for anybody to really do anything. Um, I will say, you know, Support Lanyap, uh, I think they have about 14 reporters now. You know, it used to all be free, but they actually pay people now. They go to our board <coughs> meetings. They go to city council meetings. They're our, our media, and we should embrace them. Um, because they're doing a really good job, I have to say. Um, in, in the void, you know, <laughs> of, of that. The way, the way news always worked. The newspaper reporters, uh, because they don't have to be filmed and all that stuff, could do a lot more in-depth stories, and those stories would inform the TV reporter. And all the TV reporters would spread the word on television about what the newspaper was doing. And that, that's how it worked nationally. And, you know, CBS News was always following the New York Times. Well, it was the same here. Channel 5 was following the press register. And um, so we've really lost this thing. But we do have some great reporters who are, are at, on, at the TV level and, and Lanyap and the Gulf Coast newspapers, you know, the Fairhope Courier and the Beach papers and all, they're all, you know, stepping up. Um, so, 
Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. How long ago was it that you came to the Museum of Art and did your uh, presentation there? Uh, the E.O. Wilson thing, or, or? It's where the guy, um, <coughs> it's been probably maybe 10 years ago. It's about the Amazon, it was a video, I mean, it's a movie. And um, it was on so, so, the America's Amazon movie, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so that came out in, I think, 2012. Okay. If I remember right. About right. Something then. Yeah, that. I just remember being there then. Oh, and, the, right. and the maybe the the videographer, the cameraman, mm -hmm. he used to live in Orange Beach. Uh, Lynn. 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 That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. My daughter yeah. knew Lynn uh -huh. and his uh, ex-wife now. Yeah. 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 He's he's yeah. he's uh, he got a new wife. <laughs> I met her for the first time the other day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I even sent her the CD, trying to get it back to the oh, board. All right, all right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Are you getting, is there any involvement in the Berkeley Bayfront that's, that they're getting going? Um, I, I don't really know. I've kind of fallen out of the loop with some of that stuff. Um, we got robbed of what we were promised with all that. Is um, that when the Mobile bought it? When the well, so what was supposed to happen was Airbus was going to come to Berkeley. And um, the state docks was going to get to wreck this marsh called Garrow's Bend to build their rail yard for the container port. And we, the people, were going to get back Arlington Point, which used to be a park that had uh, merry-go-rounds and, you know, bumper cars and, and back even in the 20s. Um, and you would ride a tram from downtown Mobile to this place. And there was a huge spring-fed swimming pool and all that. And we were going to get Arlington Point back as a... Um, as a park, and somehow none of that happened. Um, you know, the state docks was going to pay for it, and it was all going to be this great thing. But the Coast Guard said, no, we don't want all those people there, and various things happened. Um, incidentally, Arlington Point, which is south of the, the battleship, it's like Planet of the Apes if you go there. Um, the riprap they used around the point are the, uh, is the old columns from the courthouse they tore down, the 1800s courthouse in downtown Mobile. So the riprap is these huge ionic columns of granite with the big swirls and everything. And you pull up in a boat and it's like Planet of the Apes. You know, like what building collapsed here? What society was here? Um, it's kind of neat. I wanted to take one home, but they're pieces of granite this big, so I, I couldn't get it on the boat. Uh, I thought they were going to do some of the, uh, the living things like you were talking about. The shorelines? Well, they've done a ton. Um, there, there are quite a few around the bay. There are a bunch down in Bayou Battery and along the Sound. Um, they've done them all the way around an island called Coffee Island, trying to save it. Um, you know, our islands really, with the sea levels coming up, those barrier islands have really kind of disappeared. So we've actually made a new one um, called Marsh Island. It's covered in birds, but we use BP money to make a whole new coastal island down there. Um, it's stupid we named it Marsh Island because we have two other islands named Marsh Island. But, uh, <laughs> Alabama, we have a lot of places, you know, there's a Grand Bay in the Delta, and there's a Grand Bay over there. It makes it very confusing. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, uh, what do you see in the future of Dolphin Island as far as washing away? A lot more water. Uh, Dolphin Island is, is um, essentially doomed. Um, you know, uh, the sea level predictions they're making, um, we've already seen we're going faster. You know, they used to be saying we would have six feet of sea level by, um, you know, within the next century. And um, now we're on pace more for eight uh, feet in the next hundred years. Um, when we were doing uh, the underwater forest, that turned out that that was a very um, quick melt. And there were periods where sea levels went up 10 feet in a hundred years. Um, and 11 feet, and I think that's more what we're going to see. When people were making those six-foot predictions, they thought they were like being crazy and at the extreme, but it's looking like that's more what we're going to look. We'll go to Dauphin Island and, you know, imagine a basketball hoop over your head, and that's where the water's going to be in 80 years. So there's not a whole lot of Dauphin Island that's higher than that basketball hoop. Um, some of the dunes are on the golf course and stuff, but, um, all of that road that you used to get to Dauphin Island, that's only about three feet above sea level. If you go to um, the Chocolata boat ramp, which is next to Ralph and Keiko's on the causeway, I drove to Mobile from Fairhope every day for work for, you know, 14 years or something. 
And I never saw that parking lot at the boat ramp underwater unless we had a storm event. You know, unless there was a, a tropical storm, then that parking lot would go underwater. Um, that parking lot goes underwater multiple times a month now, just on high tide. Uh, I used to take charters out there. I can't because I can't ask my people to wade to the dock. So, you know, I'm always in Bear Park. So the sea level thing is real. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change stuff. Um, but we've seen this movie before. You know, sea level used to be out there where, you know, the underwater forest is 10 miles offshore and 60 feet underwater. And it used to be a cypress swamp. So, you know, um, and if you want to do the ultimate projection, remember I did say all of Alabama was underwater uh, 100 million years ago. So <laughs> you might want to buy land in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> If you're interested, yeah, I it's, it's, not, yeah, the it's not your movie, but there's a documentary called Flight of the Frigate Birds right, right. about Dauphin Island that's pretty interesting about the sea level changes. They actually asked me about um, making that. You know, the National History Program had come up with the idea and all, but they didn't like my prices. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? All right. Well, I have copies of Saving America's Amazon here if anyone wants one. Um, you can get it all the local bookstores along with The Last Slave Ship. Um, and so thanks for coming.